Mirdita dhe mirë së vëqeta në Tiran. Me quen lindita të samaj dhe jam profesoresh asociuar në Universitetin e Houston. Dhe sot këtu kam ardhur mrapa në shtëpin time, paka shumë. Uj pa imderi shumë dhe tesa. It is a great honor and a privilege to be here today and address this wonderful crowd and compliments to the organizers for such a wonderful venue and such a wonderful program, which I look forward to uh, for the rest of the day. But um, my address today, I will uh, address a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. I am a former journalist coming back to my stomp old stomping grounds here in the Balkans. Um, and I'm also a trained uh, journalism researcher and journalism educator currently working at the University of Houston. And my uh, address to you today sort of starts with somehow a bleak prognosis of the situation. I'm using uh, the word crisis in my title here too, but I hope that by the end of this speech today, I will convince you that things are not as dire as they look and there is a way out of the situation. So I want to start by talking about trust and what it means uh, for the field of journalism. So trustworthiness is cuts really at the core of journalism's identity in society. At the same time as journalists uh, struggle to build trust from themselves, there's plenty of research that shows that journalists are also good and media institutions are good about uh, having an impact of how we build trust in other institutions in society as well. Yet, here we are. The single biggest challenge facing journalism today is the public's lack of trust. Now, this is not a really new challenge by any means. We've seen similar trends in historical reference. But what is really worrisome is that this lack of trust is persistent and is getting worse. And I have some data to show you today that support this conclusion. And this data comes from the Reuters Institute uh, latest report on media audiences. And as you can see here, trust in news has collapsed to um, historical lows as partisan voices become more accessible online, signaling and aiding the deepening of social polarization. And as you can see here, numbers are a bit small, but uh, trust has, has fallen in some countries down in the 20s percent. In the country where I work, uh, at the United States, they are actually 23%. And what is also more worrisome uh, is that uh, this trend is going downwards. Here is um, data from certain markets, um, and over time, with the exception of the corona bond, we've seen a downward trend over the years. And the other, the other uh, worrisome thing that I want to emphasize here is that there is a polarization society in terms of how we conceptualize uh, journalism trust. At the same time, we've seen the rise of the fake news media narrative, especially coming from the right-wing politicians, not only in the United States, where I work, but also globally. Uh, and what's about to present is another very, very worrisome trend, is the amount of people, 38% in this survey, that claim that they occasionally, on, or on permanent basis, are news avoiders. And of course, we've all been there. News can be depressing, and God knows from the corona pandemic, we all are news fatigued, right? But what is very worrisome is that about 29% of, of the interviewed people claim that the reason why they avoid news is because news is untrustworthy and it is biased. And then, it should come to no surprise the next data that out of 20 markets, 20 media markets globally, only 17% of interviewed people claim to have paid for news at any point during the last year. I mean, this is really not good, right? Uh, low trust and low uh, venues as well in terms of uh, decrease in revenues for journalism. So it doesn't really bode very well. Now, I will argue that this broad trust in journalism, neither new nor historically unprecedented, it is very relevant, though, for the point in time we are today, right? Because it signals about the institutional weakness of the press in society at a time particularly where we've been seeing um, the need for the journalism's normative societal roles uh, amid a global uptick in the authoritarian 
um, and populist leaders throughout the globe. So it matters therefore not only to uh, diagnose why are we where we are, but also talk about how, what is the way forward? How do we go about fixing this problem? And that's where I wanna spend the most of the time talking to you today. And here, I would like to join uh, the bandwagon of many scholars, media scholars, but also industrial leaders who are advocating for the audience turn in journalism. And of course, this plea has been heard by many newsrooms, and we've seen many newsrooms starting to adopt uh, and assign uh, audience engagement editors. So that's a good trend. But what are they doing here is really trying to use this audience engagement as a means to uh, improve audiences' trust in the media, deliver economical benefits, and strengthen journalism democratic function in society. So now let's take a look at what do they mean? What are some of these engagement practices we've seen in the industry? Now the current debate recognizes the versatility of engagement practices um, and there are two main attitudes to this. One is this attitude or this approach on, on um, institutionalizing production-oriented types of engagement or audience engagement that uh, deal with the three stages, the first three stages of Armida's model uh, that try to engage the audiences in the news production from the idea of what news is into the information that gets into the process and process of this information into the news stories. Uh, within this approach, audiences are considered to be active users. And then there's the other approach that is more reception-oriented types of engagement that deal with the post-publication engagement in the distribution interpretation of news. And within this paradigm, we see that audiences are mainly conceptualized as reactive, uh, reactive consumers. And I'll come back to this idea in a bit, but I want to spend some time talking about the uh, production-oriented types of, of uh, engagement practices that we see in literature. Now, some newsrooms uh, practice engagement by incorporating the views and concerns and interests of the citizens through uh, in-person meetings. But these are more rare. Majority of the newsrooms that do practice some forms of production-oriented uh, types of engagement use some um, uh, digital platforms to do so. One of the examples here is um, approach by Hurricane, which is a third party uh, uh, and consultancy group in the United States that helps newsrooms connect with their audiences and helps them uh, use these third party pr platforms to post questions and, and, and gauge what, uh, what is the audience's interest, what kind of news they are interested in on. And we've seen similar, uh, similar models being adopted by a variety of newsrooms. And one thing that all of these newsrooms have in model in, in common, as you can see here, the list of most best, some of the best examples of engagement are the, the financial model. Most of these come from local and community media, public media, and nonprofit organizations that have a stake, a big stake in really building, strengthening relationships with their audiences. I want to spend a minute here to talk about one such model, which is a homegrown model actually from the neighboring Kosovo. And this is the case study of Kalza.com, a digitally integration crowdsourcing platform implemented by the uh, Balkan Investigative Reporting Network and Internews Kosovo in, in Pristina. In the summer of 2019, I spent about a week in this newsroom trying to observe and do interviews with journals and editors here to see how they practice and conceptualize their audience engagement. And one of the interesting things about this platform is the way it's being conceptualized. So there are three functions to this, uh, to this platform. Um, if you go first. So, um, Culture.com is used as an ex uh, extension of the news gathering media machine, as a publishing platform, and also as, as a platform that is used to facilitate sustained interaction between the newsrooms, institutions, and, and audience members. And I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about each of these uh, particular uh, uh, uses that this platform has. So as a digital crowdsourcing tool, um, uh, this was the, the original meaning or the original conception of this of, of culture.com was as a means to uh, to uh, solicit reports from the general public about corruption and irregularities in the provisions of public service in their communities. And this platform has truly become all-encompassing, as they were informing me that their informants come from all cor corners of the country. 
Uh, and then lots of this information that is processed internally through the internal side of this platform uh, and then used to actually, uh, these citizen reports are used to incorporate into investigative news stories that are published on the other side of this platform, which is the publishing platform. Uh, but what is even more interesting about this platform is the way that these news reports, our audience uh, empowered news stories are used for advocacy. So lots of the uh, journals I was talking to and even news editors were telling us, uh, telling me that it's not enough in the environment in which they work in Kosovo, it is not enough to only report. If you only report, nothing will happen. So one of their aims is to uh, actually advocate for social change, for solutions to practical problems of their, uh, of their uh, audiences. And, and that's what kind of they, they do in this. So um, in this model or this example uh, here from our, our own country, right, um, talks about how digital platforms can allow newsrooms to interact with their audiences at the, uh, in, in an efficient and anonymous way while uh, helping this bottom-up storytelling. And that's what really is crucial for this long-standing relationship, this bottom-up storytelling. Um, lots of their audiences feel really protected, feel, feel that their voice is being heard, therefore um, feel confident to go and report more and more. Actually, at this point, they were telling me that they have so many reports that it's impossible for them to, to actually process all of this information. But what's unique about this is that this platform is unique in the, in the transformation of these citizen-provided data into knowledge to encourage civic action, institutional accountability, and community solutions as well. When I was there, I was told, we are the most trusted news in Kosovo. And then I went to look for some data that supports this, and indeed I did find it. This is one of the news reports that shows that platforms such as uh, Beard and similar uh, um, investigative reports are among some of the most trusted news sources in, in the country. And what I was really happy to see, their call recently about uh, spreading this particular um, model into other newsrooms, and they are giving grants into which they are offering to go and train other newsrooms to this, use these platforms to build these types of uh, relationships with the audiences. And I do hope a lot of newsrooms in the region took advantage of this call, and I look forward to actually do a follow-up study with, the, with them as well. But um, at the same time, I would like to spend a couple of minutes with uh, some other types of uh, relationship, this reception-oriented. While they are considered to be a bit less um, effective in, in building this long-term relationship, I want to talk about how there are some ways that news editors, news producers can actually use this reception-oriented to build meaningful relationship with the, with the audience. Now, for a long time, there is, uh, in literature, there's been emphasis on this uh, news gap or uh, the gap between what news, pre news producers' preferences and news users' preferences in terms of what topics audiences are interested in. And research is, st is starting to show how this gap is also translated into social media. There's a gap between what news producers share on social media and what consumers share. Um, indeed, during elections, it seems that this gap shrinks in terms of interest between news producers and audiences. But in a, in a series of studies, I was interested to, to look at how framing, specific framing of, elect, of election news might impact engagement on social media. So just a little bit of, of background in terms of how, how, what the literature tells us in terms of how elections are being covered cross country. So there are three different core characteristics of election reporting. One is media depolitization, or which means marginalization of policies and platforms and focus on this uh, strategy or the strategies that news me uh, that uh, uh, candidates are using to win elections and where they are in the game. Also there is an emphasis on personalization or leader-centered stories. Um, and the third characteristic is uh, negativity or emphasis of confrontation and conflict. So I was interested to see to what degree audiences were also interested in these frames and were interacting with these kind of frames. Uh, so in a, in a, in a study um, that I did together with our host here, uh, Elis Cela and Julia Reja in Kosovo, we're trying to look at in the context of 2019 general elections in Kosovo and 2021 parliamentary elections in Albania to see how news framing of these elections was uh, engaging audiences on Facebook. And one of the things that we found actually uh, uh, in this in this study is that um, this is kind of our model. Um, if you please, 
um, continue. So one of the things that we found is that Australian horse race coverage, it's uh, similar to other countries in the world, also in this region, are predominant frames that are used to report on elections. Uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to um, engagement, here are some of the interesting findings. If you look at the issue coverage and candidate attacks as a frame of reference, actually those were generating less and less engagement. It looks like Albanian um, or consumers, news consumers, were not as engaged with those frames. The only frame that showed systematic kind of engagement was candidate personalities. And I would say that's not a surprise given so much discourse about corruption and uh, interest in the, in the candidates' personalities and morals and such. So that seems to really generate some more and more engagement. When you look at the strategy and horse race framing, that generated more reactions, but then was less likely actually it did, we find a relation with decreasing comments as well. Now we tried to look at, uh, in a different study with my uh, colleague Leah Helmuller, I was trying to look at the same patterns in the context of the United States 2012 presidential elections there. And what we found was really interesting, and if you look here, we compared uh, shares, we were kind of really focused a bit more on new sharing practices. And we looked at these uh, different frames, how they, uh, I guess, affect sharing practices of the audiences in Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the, the data that focus on the sharing across different platforms show that actually people or news users in the context of the United States are more interested in issue coverage and candidate personalities as well. So where they are more likely to share news that focus on those particular aspects of elections. Uh, while strategy and horse frame as a frame were less likely to be shared. But then comparing Twitter and Facebook, we found that compared to Facebook, actually Twitter, uh, all of these were more likely to be shared on Twitter. Another interesting uh, result from this study was that when we compared audiences, English and Spanish audiences, or uh, audiences of English and Spanish media, we also found differences. Signaling that there is actually, in terms of what, when we talk about engagement, there are cultural and ethnic differences in terms of how people are, are engaged with the news. Um, sorry, you can just go back. And, and the last point I want to make is about uh, orientation and the new or, or engagement in the news comments. Now, this is one of those thorny. Um, thorny questions. To what degree news comments are actually useful? To what degree news comments can, um, can in, incite some kind of meaningful conversations or meaningful engagement with their with uh, the audiences? And they're being sort of, uh, can, are we seeing more news with deliberation or are we seeing incivility and really uh, how they become kind of cesspools for, for discussion? So that's why we're trying to kind of look into in a study that was published recently into the context of 2016 presidential elections. So I looked at all these different frames and tried to kind of look at the relation between news framing of elections and uh, deliber news deliberation. And this is really some interesting findings that uh, we found in, in the context of this study. So when news, when news media were focusing on issues and candidate claims, meaning candidates uh, focus on their own political strategies and deeds, uh, the news comments under th those news uh, posts tended to be more rational. They tend to increase rationality and interactivity in the news comments. But when news posts focus on candidate personalities and candidate attacks, these were actually more likely to increase the disagreement and incivility in the comment sections as well. So this is really telling in terms of what we can, we can expect, uh, how news framing impacts the, the discourse, the quality of discourse. And in a different study, again, uh, under review currently, we're looking at this relationship uh, with toxicity more specifically and emotions in news. Um, and this is what we found. Uh, basically, when news reports uh, quoted uh, candidates when they were interpreting and when they were posting on Facebook media engaging, trying to engage their audiences, trying to ask them, come ask questions, come talk to us, right? They were more likely to decrease uh, toxicity in the comment section as well. So what does this mean? Um, um, so some takeaway messages here from this uh, train of, of research that I with my esteemed colleagues have done says that news content of framing is one way that news producers can control and influence how people engage with news on social media. 
Uh, however, I will argue here today that rather than chasing clicks, it's important for news producers to consider what type of meaningful conversations and engagements are they, can they produce with this framing. And it's important to offer uh, some better user experiences. It's not only about clicks. Here we are talking about the benefits of good user experiences so those audiences keep coming back right, for more news. Um, and here this research also emphasizes the need to pay attention to not only to different platforms but also the cultural and ethnic diversity of the audiences that consume certain news. But I want to also uh, kind of go by saying that Google Analytics and audience metrics provide a very limited view of who the audiences are. Right? In terms of, and, and there's research showing that journals are actually out of touch with their audiences across different countries. So, here I want to advocate for the concept of relish, relational journalism as a way forward uh, that focuses on better understanding, listening to, and engaging with people in ways that are mutually beneficial, solution oriented, and fundamentally relationship driven. And I love this quote from Catherine Fink who says, my suggestion for building trust is modest, low-tech, and unoriginal. Journalists should have more conversations with strangers. That is, once a week, every journalist should meet someone new. Go out to the coffee shop, or cream, ice cream, or whatever. Just talk to your audiences. And here I'm going to add, in the context of the Balkans we are, talk to the taxi drivers and bus drivers. They have the best stories ever. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this today, and I look forward to more conversations. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and please do keep in touch. Um, <laughs> to continue the discussion.